Half in the Bag. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Half in the Bag. I'm Mike. And I'm Jay. And on this episode, we're going to talk about all the films of 2016. Well, all the ones that we saw. That's right. All the ones that we saw that we didn't previously do on Half in the Bag. That's correct. Because as you know, Mike, the only movies that we ever discuss on Half in the Bag are comic book movies. You know, except for The Hateful Eight. The Ridiculous Six. The Revenant. Me, Him, Her. Ten Cloverfield Lane. Hardcore Henry. Green Room. Independence Day Resurgence. Ghostbusters. Star Trek Beyond. Stranger Things. Don't Breathe. Blair Witch. Shut In. Or Arrival. But aside from those, it's nothing but comic book movies ever. In fact, this was a good year for comic book movies, or was it a bad year? I don't even know anymore. Let's look at the numbers. Well, we have some statistics here, Mike. Uh, we have the top 10 worldwide grossing movies of the year. Uh, and then just to compare, we have the top 10 US grossing movies of the year. Jay, how did 2016 compare to previous years in film? Oh, that I don't know. I don't have any notes about that. But out of the top 10, we've got uh, how, many, uh, how many comic book movies? One, two, three, four, five. Half of them are comic book movies. Uh, number one worldwide was Captain America Civil War, made over a billion dollars. Uh, number two also made over a billion dollars, Finding Dory. Someone must have seen it. Uh, Zootopia, another animated movie about talking animals, also made a billion dollars. Uh, just under a billion dollars at number four was The Jungle Book with 966 million. Oh my god, number five is another talking animal movie, Mike. It's The Secret Life of Pets with 874 million. So I guess uh, talking animals is the way to go. When are they going to make a new version of Animal Farm by George Orwell? Well, I think, I think they go for like happy, friendly... Uh, talking animal movie. Well, they'll just they'll just change it. But it's not about communism. No, it would just just be about. It'll be uh, about friendship. Uh, it'll be about friendship. Okay. Or the the, the the communist system the animal set up works brilliantly. Oh, there you go. Uh, number six, everyone's favorite, Batman v Superman, eight hundred and seventy three million dollars. Uh, the highest grossing movie. Okay, this is statistically the highest grossing movie of all time that absolutely nobody liked. No. Oh. Um, and then number seven is Deadpool, 782 million. Number eight is Suicide Squad, 745 million. Uh, then Doctor Strange with 617 million. And then number 10, The Mermaid, the Stephen Chow movie that was huge in China oh. or wherever. And I don't think it's even played here yet. Oh, so we're <laughs> doing worldwide returns. That was worldwide. Uh, the top 10 US is almost the same, except no, The Mermaid. Okay. But. Uh, the point is, or the trend is, if you want to make a billion dollars, make a movie about a comic book, or a talking animal, or a mermaid. Um, so these are the ty type of movies that we like to do on Half in the Bag, because they're the type of movies that le everyone likes to discuss. Yes. Well, Jay, uh, we're now going to take the roster for Half in the Bag 2016 and throw it out the window. Oh my God. And we're going to talk about stuff that was not featured on any Half in the Bag episode this year. Looking back at 2016, what would you say your favorite film was? The Witch. What went we out into this wilderness to find? Leaving our country, kindred, our father's houses. For what? The Vavitch. The Vavitch. The Vitch is my favorite movie of the year. Uh, I love it. I think it's a masterpiece. Uh, that's one. Some of these movies are ones that we've both seen. You've also seen The Witch, right? I don't know if I'd say it was my favorite movie of the year. I would say it's the best movie of the year. It's so fucking good. It's I, the first time filmmaker, which is shocking to me because it's yeah. so, like it feels like it's made by someone that's been making movies for decades. It's like a master of their craft. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, very Kubrick-esque. It reminded me of The Shining. Um, as far as the, the sort of deterioration of the mental state of this family uh, and the, just the constant dread mm -hmm. and this, this just really intense atmosphere uh, that sticks with you long after you're done watching the movie. It's a creepy feeling movie. Yes, it's so well done. Boo! <laughs> It's 
it's a it's a it's an edge of your seat but not in an action packed kind of way movie it's a oh my god yeah where those long lingering shots you don't know what's going to happen next i loved it i thought it was visual i thought it was breathtaking and then i farted a lot <laughs> 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 I don't know why I said that. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a movie about a goat named Sammy the Goat. No, he's Black Phillip. Black Phillip, the new horror icon, Black the, Phillip. Yeah, um, uh, the acting is superb, especially the child actors in it. Yeah, um, there's, the, there's really there's intense two, scenes. Two little kids, and then the older daughter, and then the parents, and the two little kids are like little adults. Like, like, kid actors usually suck anyway, but especially in a movie like this, where you have to explain to these small children how to authentically replicate, you know, the 1600s and the dialect, because the dialogue in this movie is very uh, era accurate in a way you don't hear very often. Yeah, well, yeah and the, the dialogue and the, the accents. Yeah. The accents are really different. Um, there's not, not a lot in terms of story, no. Which is, which is, you know, I usually like a really cohesive narrative where I'm like, okay, I know what's happening. But then there's movies like this where the the whole movie as a whole congeals so well with everything else. Well, it just, yeah, it just sucks you in with the atmosphere and the the look of everything. It's, a, it's an atmospheric piece. It's a ten, tension filled movie. It's disturbing. It's strange. It keeps you engaged by all those elements. Well, I love. I know some people. Uh, one of their complaints about it is that uh, it, it it gives away any sort of mystery early on. I don't want to get too much into spoilers, but I guess this is the beginning of the movie, so why not? But it's like, you know, you go see this movie, this family has been exiled from their, their uh, the village that they live in and they're living on the edge of the woods. And so it's like, oh, is there gonna be a witch? Is it gonna be like a psychological thing or is there really a witch? Oh, there's a witch, there's a witch and it's doing something completely fucking vile in the first five minutes of the movie. So then it's just like, I don't know, to me that doesn't dissolve the tension. It's like the old Hitchcock thing of like, we know there's a bomb under the table, but mm. the characters don't. Right. Where it's like you're watching this family turn on each other and you're just waiting to see like when it all falls apart. Let's leave in the wood. Kubrick-esque, and that will lead me to my next film, which I will say tied or came to a very close second to The Witch, and that's The Brothers Grimsby, <laughs> star starring, um, starring Sasha Baron Cohen. But now, he's going undercover. How could you not tell your own brother what you do? I'm a spy! You know you should keep that quiet. I've also seen this film, and it, we should point out, because I also have least profitable films of 2016, ah. and uh, The Brothers Grimsby is number eight on there of the top 10. Budget 35 million, box office 28.7 million. Wow, it couldn't turn a profit from a $35 million budget. Nope, no wow. one wanted to see this Brothers Grimsby. Yeah, this movie sank faster than the Titanic. <laughs> uh, and I don't know why, uh, it's weird. I saw a trailer last night or yesterday or the day before for a new movie called like Office Christmas Party. Oh yeah. Jason Bateman, Jennifer Aniston, you know, your your usuals. Yeah. Um, and it's like, oh, someone fell off the wall and someone farted on a cake and whoops, there's a donkey in the elevator. Yeah. Heavens have mercy. Wacky hijinks. Um, so no one's ever made a wild movie about that, and here it comes, here it comes! 32% Rotten Tomatoes score, tanks. <laughs> Just like, at, like, Is that your prediction? It doesn't yeah. come out yet, right? Well, well, the thing is, it's like, that's my prediction. 32%. Every, mo every comedy tanks, and pop I see- Pop star, the Andy Samberg movie, star, that's yeah. one of the biggest ones on yeah. my list here. And, and you know what it is, it's not like, it's not the, that the audience, I don't know if it's a mixture of audience not wanting to see it, with Popstar, there wasn't a lot of interest from the audience. Yeah. But it's also like reviews being horrifically negative. The Brothers Grimsby had terrible reviews. And a lot of these other comedy movies have terrible reviews. And then you go in there and I, I thoroughly enjoyed Brothers Grimsby. I, yeah, I don't think I could defend it as a good movie, but what I can say is that I laughed a fair amount, which I rarely do. It's weird, I laugh a lot, like just in real life, in general. I'm always laughing at crap, but when I watch a comedy movie, I'm like 
it takes very weird and specific things to make me laugh. Um, and Sasha Baron Cohen, even in this movie, The Brothers Grimsby, there's a number of parts that are so stupid. But they're stupid in a very specific way that I've noticed in his movies, where it's almost like like a self-aware, almost like he's doing it ironically, which makes me think of you when we do like a terrible fart joke. Sure. And it's like, we know it's terrible. Uh, and so he has this sort of almost like dedication to going as stupid as he possibly can uh, that is almost admirable even when I don't think it works. And there's a couple sequences in this movie that def definitely do not work. Oh, sure. But he's not afraid to get really uh, genuinely offensive, mm -hmm. which I appreciate. Yeah. I love everything this man does <laughs> from Ali G on. Oh, these heated seats make you feel like you've pissed yourself. They're all heated seats. Oh. He just just throws it all out there. And like, what, what, who, who gets AIDS by blood <laughs> flying in their mouth? Is it? Multiple people get AIDS blood in their mouth, <laughs> if I recall. Yes. I, I didn't see this movie in months, but. There was like, yeah, the, 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 chi the AIDS child gets shot and then, of course, there's the elephant uterus scene. Yes. Which, I mean, we could probably pull up a clip of it, but we're not even going to bother. Yeah. Uh, watch the movie for that alone. It goes to such an extreme. It reminded me of, like, the early 2000s gross-out comedies. Yeah. Where it's yes. like everyone's trying to top there's something about Mary. Yeah. But this one goes so far that it... His dedication to just being as awful as possible. Yeah, but it's not, <laughs> it's not like... I don't know. It's not over the top awful, like I'm just trying to be awful for awful sake. No, it's gratuitous. It's intentionally gratuitous. It's intentionally gratuitous, but self-aware. Yeah. And, and I think that's the key point is that it's not, it's most people just go, oh, that's stupid. But I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's a preference. Maybe it's a certain taste, but. It, it, it at least feels like somebody's vision, somebody's comedic vision, as opposed to something like Office Christmas Party, which yes. just feels like generic studio comedy. Yeah. My, my, my one negative about the Brothers Grimsby, well, not my one negative, but the biggest thing, problem I had with it is, is the pacing felt really relentless. Like they were afraid to give anything room to breathe. I just remember it moved so fast that I found it a little too, a, a little too fast paced for a comedy. Okay. Let them jokes play a little bit more. Like the elephant uterus joke? Things. Well, that one could have gone on for another 25 minutes and that would have been fine. Well, the film I saw, I don't believe you did, uh, is The Neon Demon. Neon Demon is my uh, other favorite movie of the I year. I haven't seen so much red since I visited a ketchup factory. Well, you tried. Uh, the Neon Demon is my other favorite movie of the year. I loved this movie. Uh, it's... <laughs> what is that? You don't even know where it is. Just you're rolling up. your eyes. Oh, so you're up. just looking up. It's unrelated. I see. Uh, like Drive, it's a very simple story, but it's more about the way the story is told that makes it interesting. Um, some people call that like style over substance. I just call it filmmaking. I don't know. Uh, in beautiful cinematography, best looking movie of the year. Uh, favorite score of the year. Keanu Reeves shows up and he gives a really weird uh, kind of sleazy performance that made me laugh. And I think that's the key is unlike Only God Forgives, which was really dry. Um, this movie's got a really kind of dark, wicked sense of humor to it that I appreciated. And then in the last act, it gets really fucked up. Really fucked up in a way that I saw it in a mall theater playing right next door to Finding Dory. And I was like, this is wonderful that I'm seeing something so filthy and vile <laughs> in a mall theater. We, we talked about with, I think it was with Don't Breathe, where we talked about like classy trash where it's like, it looks nice, it looks slick, but it's really kind of more of an exploitation movie. And I, I would put uh, Neon Demon in that category too. Mm. So tell me, Jay, when you got out of the theater, you switched the signs, right? Oh, of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what my mother used to call me? Dangerous. Let's talk about another, uh, L uh, l let's talk about a film that we both saw, I think. The Nice Guys. <laughs> March, we're gonna play a game. I think you have the wrong house. Oh, we called Shut Up Unless You're Me. Oh yeah, the, the Russell, Shane Black film. Russell Crowe 
and Ryan, Ryan Gosling, Gosling. Speaking of Nicholas Winding Refn. Yeah. Nice guys in the 1970s era cop film, buddy cop drama, comedy, mainly comedy. Russell Crowe as a grizzled old curmudgeon, and Ryan Gosling as the hapless, wacky detective with a little daughter. I can't, you know, I can honestly say I don't even remember what the actual plot of the movie is, and it doesn't even matter. This there is was a like... murdered porn star <laughs> who drove her car off a cliff and crashed in the backyard of a little right. boy in the That's beginning. That's right. Uh, it's more, but it is more of a movie. It's a, it's a classic sort of buddy action comedy, the kind yeah. they don't really make anymore. Right. Uh, Russell Crowe's great in it. I usually don't like him very much, but he's good. Ryan Gosling is fucking hilarious. I got a license to carry, dumbass. And ever since your little visit, this little baby's going to stay right here. Don't move. I think the only things I've seen him in are the the, uh, the other Nicholas Winding Refn films. So I just know him as like serious man that doesn't talk. Oh um, no, Ryan Gosling has 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 range. Yeah, nice guys. I, I've heard complaints that like it was boring. What? I've heard people say that. Um, mainly because it's not like it feels like a movie from the '80s. Yeah. Uh, where there's not a lot of like over the top ridiculous action sequences the only action in the movie is people shooting guns at each other and it's completely satisfying because you like these characters that's all you need it feels very retro and very throwback it's very um subdued like the way just the way everything happens in it it's really unfortunate that a movie that is just a a solid well-written funny action comedy is now considered like a quaint throwback movie yeah there's no big set pieces it's just no big set pieces other than just like uh, I mean, the, there was a set piece towards the end with, like, on top of the hotel, yeah. you know. But it was, it's totally, That would, that would like, be uh, substandard for the opening of a modern action movie. And exactly. that's the big ending yeah. of this movie. But it's, it's, it's more just, like, a fun, like you said, you can't really remember what the plot is. Yeah, it's, no, it, it's like, a, like a Big Lebowski, or it's more yeah. about just sort of, like, hanging out with these characters. It's these hanging out with these characters, exactly. So that's a winner. Yes. Come on! Uh, well, here's another one we both saw. We've already made fun of it several times on uh, Half in the Bag and, and Best of the Worst. It's The Boy. Ah. Brahms is not like other children. It is very important that you follow these rules. Be good to him and he'll be good to you. Classic, uh, spoilers, the classic uh, Guy Living in the Walls movie. That the came Boring. Out, that came out in January. Um, yeah, it's very boring. <laughs> uh, lady <laughs> has to go uh, help uh, be a nanny at a house for uh, grandma and grandpa. And then, Not yeah. her grandma and grandpa, no. just an old couple. Just an old couple, and they're very wealthy. They have a mansion. She comes in and she says... I'm a nanny, I'm here, I'm here to do my job as a nanny. And then they, they go, here's our son. And then, ha ha ha, you're fucking kidding me, right, Grandma? Because oh. cause it's a doll. Yeah, it's a doll. And then um, I think her crazy boyfriend shows up at the end. Yeah, this is like comically over the top yeah. asshole boyfriend. Yeah. Oh, but you left out. Uh, they leave the doll with the girl, the two old people, and then they go off to kill themselves oh, yeah. by walking into the ocean, yeah. which is like <laughs> the least efficient way to kill yourself. Oh, yeah. What a terrible way to try and try and commit suicide. It was, it was, um, it was a, a visual, Jay. It was, it was beautiful. There are no visuals in this movie. It's just flat, boring shots of hallways. I, I wanted to see Grandma and Grandpa with butcher knives. Just going, one, <laughs> two, three. No, you go first. No, no, you. If that had been the whole movie, just a movie about an old couple that are tr- uh, like trying to kill each other or kill themselves at the same time. Yeah, it just keeps cutting back yeah. to them like in different ways. They're like holding rocks above their heads, like, and you're gonna drop it, and, like, push each other off a cliff. <laughs> they're about to. They're holding hands. They're gonna jump off a cliff. But yeah. They both. Yep. Neither of them tried. You hesitated, Bernie. And then we keep cutting back to the woman in the house with the doll, and at the end of the movie, she's like, oh, I guess it was just a doll. No, no, no. The big twist now in movies is going to be, there's a ghost. (laughs) The house is haunted. Oh, my God. I thought it was a boy in the walls. (laughs) (laughs) You will be good to him, won't you? (laughs) 
I watched a film starring uh, Chris Pine called The Finest Hours. I don't even know what this is. I repeat, conditions hazardous. We've got an 18 foot fracture in our home. How do you want us to proceed, over? It was, it was exactly what I thought it was going to be. It's a good old fashioned movie. <laughs> I said, you know what? That looks like a good movie. I want to watch that. that. That was me as an old man. Okay. It's about, it takes place in the early 1950s. And it's a true story based on the most daring maritime rescue of a vessel in distress in the history of the United States Coast Guard. Now, if that don't catch you, I don't know what, what will. So this is, this is one of those movies that, like, when you run into your grandpa at a family get-together, he says, I saw this movie yes. on it, TNT the other afternoon. Exactly, Jay. I don't remember what it was called, <laughs> but it was about, and then he tells you exactly what you just said. Yeah. It's kind of like that, that movie that came out, which I did not see, called Deepwater Horizon. No, Mark yeah. Wahlberg on the BP oil rig that exploded a couple years back. Yeah. And I said, all well, the critics gave it great reviews. And I said to myself, you know what? That's probably a damn good movie about an exploding oil rig. <laughs> That's heartwarming and, and, and patriotic and quality. And I said, uh, I don't need to see it. You'll, you'll see it on, and when it's on in the afternoon on TNT, and then you'll tell some relative at your next family gathering, mm. I saw this movie. Do you remember that oil spill? <laughs> well, I saw a film uh, very similar. It was called The Greasy Strangler. Tell you a secret. I am the Greasy Strangler. Hey, I call bullshit on that. <laughs> Is it one of your weird sex pervert movies? Uh, kind of. It, it's a. It's produced by Elijah Wood. It got a pretty wide release. Uh, it's like I said earlier. Like when I'm actually watching a comedy film, like I don't laugh a lot. This movie was fucking hilarious. I what was, was laughing. What was it called again? Perfect Strangers. The Greasy Strangler. It's uh, sort of like John Waters meets Tim and Eric. I, I have to say this. I'm very intrigued. <laughs> and I'm not being sarcastic. Sure. When um, John Waters meets Tim and Eric. Tell yeah. me more. My dad can get cranky sometimes. As your father, I forbid you to marry. He sure has a temper on him. He likes to shout. I like to smile. <laughs> I, well, I, a lot of people have been comparing it to Tim and Eric, and I think it's more just because the, one of the main guys looks and sounds exactly like Eric from Tim and Eric. He's big and has kind of a dumb guy voice, but it's, it's essentially a love triangle between a father, a son, and this girl that they meet. Um, and the father also happens to be uh, a local serial killer called the Greasy Strangler. He's an elderly man that, that uh, is completely nude, covers himself with grease, and goes around and strangles people. And he also loves grease on his food. The more grease, the better. He wants enough grease to fill the world, is what he says when he gets his food. Um, and so he lives with his son, and they have a, like a little love triangle with this woman. It's gross, but it's gross in a really like innocent way, like looking at Garbage Pail Kids cards, you know? Okay. It's, it's not like, like off-puttingly gross. Uh, it's got the most bizarre dialogue. It, it casts, I guess you would say they're bad actors. I would say uh, unconventional actors where you give them the right dialogue and the things they say will be way more hilarious than if you cast a professional actor in that role. Kind of like, uh, like the egg lady in Pink Flamingos. What do you mean Humpty Dumpty was an egg? How could a person be an egg, Cotton? How could a person be an egg? Or it's like, that dialogue coming out of someone else's mouth would not be this funny. Um, and that's the whole movie. Is so, like, uh, like Leonardo DiCaprio. Exactly. <laughs> Do you remember him in The Revenant? I remember how, how hilarious his attempts at acting in The Revenant were. You know. So is this a funnier film than The Revenant? <laughs> <laughs> well, no one gets raped by a bear. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly not a movie for everybody. I've read some complaints that it, it, people saying it's trying too hard to be like, like, a, like a cult movie or something, but... 
I, I just watched it as a comedy, and it made me laugh a lot. Well, all right, Jay approves another weird sex <laughs> film. You're all right, Braden. Thanks, Dad. That means a lot coming from you. Well, another film we both saw, Conjuring 2. They're calling it England's Amityville. There is a family that desperately needs our help. After everything we've seen, there isn't much that rattles either of us anymore. But this one, this one still haunts me. Solid, solid, creep, creepy film. Uh, a little bit of a, uh, again, a little bit of a stretch from the reality of the ghost story that it's based on. Do you uh, think? You think so? I don't know if you'd call it a stretch. More like a... A complete fabrication. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, the only thing that's, that's based in reality is that there was this family in a house and the Warrens went to it. Well, there, 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 there's some stuff. I did a little research after watching it, but certainly the house didn't explode and a quarter <laughs> while didn't open and a giant de demon comes out yeah. and, and starts trashing London and then space <laughs> aliens show up. <laughs> In reverse time. As, as far as like the kind of mainstream horror goes, James Wan is the only one that seems to, like as far as contemporary ones go, that knows how to stage and execute a proper like horror sequence that has a build up and a payoff that isn't just jump scares. He does them, but he uses them sparingly and he uses them effectively. Good, good film. The Conjuring films are good. Uh, yeah, I liked them. I liked the first one more, and I haven't seen the first one since the theater, but I remember it being more kind of grounded and kind of old school uh, horror. Yeah. And the second one, things were more over the top in a way that as it went along, I kind of yeah, got the, disinterested. The exorcism at the end of the first one went into the over the top territory as Wasn't well. It like she was in a chair that was like uh, spinning or, yeah. yeah. But this one, there's like a there's a character that shows up called the Crooked Man, and it looks like something out of a Tim Burton movie. It's right. like, eh, I know you do those those insidious movies. This feels more appropriate for those. Something a little more fantastical. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's another sequence where they're trying to uh, uh, get in touch with the, the the demon in the house, and the whole thing is uh, the demon doesn't want you to look at it or whatever. And so we get a close up of our character's face, uh, looking away from it. And it's a little girl that's possessed, so she's in the background out of focus, and we just focus on Ed's face the whole time, and she's just out of focus in the background and kind of slowly morphs yeah. into the demon. And it's all just out of focus in the background. And I, li I like the, the kind of smaller scale sequences like that. James Wan delivers quality horror films. I just wish he wouldn't get so over the top at the end. Yeah, but you gotta, you gotta, gotta make those, those teenagers look up from their cell phones. That's true. Did you see Demolition? You know, I, I keep a list of movies to talk about, you know, whenever we end up doing these. And I was looking through my list in preparation for this, and I saw Demolition on it. And I said, what the fuck is that? Did I see that? And I had to look it up to remind myself that it's a movie I watched. Dear Champion Vending Company, I put five quarters in your machine and proceeded to push B2, which should have given me peanut M&Ms. Regrettably, it did not. I found this upsetting as I was very hungry, and also my wife had died 10 minutes earlier. Demolition, I, I, it had a really good trailer and a good premise, and... Yeah, well, what I, what I remembered once it came back to me, once my memory was jogged, was it, it's his wife dies, and he starts having, like, a conversation with a uh, tech support person, right? It's Naomi Watts. No, 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 he writes a letter to a vending machine company. Yeah, yeah, and so they start communicating that way. But simultaneous to that, uh, to as the title says, demolition, he starts kind of slowly dismantling everything in his house and destroying his house. And it's like, symbolism, got it. From what I recall, it's, it, it was a good film. I, I, it's an adequate drama. But it's not, it's not, it's, yeah, it hasn't taken root. If if in you the like brain. on the nose symbolism and and okay drama, well, Jay, 
Let's talk about the lobster in the room. <laughs> and the dog? My brother, he was here a couple of years ago, but he didn't make it. Did you read the leaflet? Yes, I did. As you understand from your brother's experience, if you fail to fall in love with someone during your stay here, you'll turn into an animal. Have you ever danced with anybody? Yes. As an animal, you'll have a second chance to find a companion. I like The Lobster. I have a feeling on rewatch, it's a movie that I, I will uh, find more rewarding. Its sense of humor is insanely dry, which I liked. Um, I like the premise. You can go to this uh, compound to meet a mate for life. And if you don't meet your mate in a month or whatever it is, then you get turned into an animal. And everything's very cut and dry and specific in this place. Like, you have to be uh, either straight or gay. You can't be bi. When he's getting his shoe size, he's like 13 and a half. And they're like, we have 13 or we have 14. And so everything's very regimented and specific like that. Sounds exciting. <laughs> like I said, it's a very dry sense of humor and it's very bizarre. But the, the, the humor is never funny or witty. Have you thought of what animal you'd like to be if you end up alone? Yes, a lobster. A lobster is an excellent choice. Let me just say this. I love lobster. <laughs> the food? Yeah. I but I hate the lobster. I, I didn't finish it. I shut it off. Okay. Uh, and rarely... Just, just out of boredom? Or? Well, when the, by the time he ended up in the woods... Well, that, that's the thing, is the movie is essentially two halves. The first half is all in the compound, and that's the really strong stuff, I thought. Uh, and then he leaves, and the second half is sort of a parallel of that, where it's this is a he joins this community where you're supposed to be more free, and they don't have all these restrictions and rules, but he comes to discover that they have their own restrictions and rules. So it sort of parallels it. Um, the problem is I just don't think the second half is as strong as the first half. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm too dumb. Maybe I didn't get their their wonderful, brilliant uh, metaphors or whatever they were trying to say about relationships or human nature, something. But I found the the strangeness to be distracting in, in a bad way. Um, very rarely did I laugh or find the 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 way that it was presented to be humorous like i get it but it, to me it just became frustrating like oh see i thought the way it was executed is what made it work it was so like shots are just locked off and it's very stark and it, the the way it was shot is dry in addition to the, like the dialogue and the, the yeah i mean i can appreciate that in something else but i just <laughs> i wasn't getting anything out of it i like a weird movie i like a dry movie I like a dry wit but with this, I was just like, maybe it was above me, and I'm not going to pretend I liked it because <laughs> everyone else did. I thought it sucked, and I was bored. Okay. I enjoyed it. I, I didn't love it. I think what I said right after seeing it was, I think I liked it. If you encounter any problems you cannot resolve yourselves, you will be assigned children. That usually helps. Mike, have you heard about a film called The Shallows? I've seen it around. It's a shark movie or something. It's a shark movie, and it's terrible. A lot of people seem to like it, I guess. Um, How is it different from Open Water? Uh, it's different in the sense that Open Water... You've seen Open Water? No, but I know the premise. Oh, okay. O more. Open Water was very, uh, like, fly on the wall, realistic, uh, boring in a good way, where it's like they're stuck out at sea. This is how it would be. Uh, the Shallows is ex the exact opposite of that. It's overly stylized. Our main character, she gets stranded out in the water with a shark, and she's just constantly talking to herself, explaining exactly how she feels and exactly what she's trying to do at every possible moment. Uh, there's no subtlety. It's, it's, it's aiming for uh, the dummies in the audience to make sure they understand exactly what's happening at all times. Um, there's no like gritty realism. You never feel like she's actually stranded out there because uh, the actress's name is Blake Lively. 
and she's super hot in the movie, which in and of itself is not a problem, but in the context of what's happening, it's distracting, where it's like she's been laying out on this rock, sun beating down on her for days, and she looks like perfect, except for a little bit of chap lips, and that's it. Uh, it's almost worth seeing, though, for the last 10 minutes, when it turns to complete schlock, complete action CG shark, unbelievable, uh, schlock. Oh my god. So, yeah. Uh, the shallow sucks, uh, but it's sort of funny. <laughs> Another breakout movie of the year that uh, was polarizing, or people liked or didn't, was called Swiss Army Man. Oh, yeah. This is crazy. I thought you were dead. Am I dead? I don't think so. You're talking. Yeah. Hi. You're special. I'm special. You're like the multi-purpose tool guy. Uh, Swiss Army Man. Uh, I hear people walked out of this film at Sundance. I guess I can understand why. I don't know. I enjoyed it. I thought it was very funny in a very odd and specific way. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Uh, it's, it's not a great film, but it's different. Yes. Very, very different. Well, that's, I think that's something you can say about all of, at least on my list, like my favorites, like The Witch and Neon Demon and, uh, and this and some other movies is that they they feel like movies that are made by a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. You know, it's these are that, reasons why we don't review them on a <laughs> movie review show. We got to talk about Captain America Eight. Yeah, where Captain America punches people. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Swiss Army Man. It's it's hard to pin down the tone of it because it's got farts and boners and weird, potentially gross out things. But it's delivered with this sort of whimsical sincerity. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's it's just like charming. Well, the it, boners are charming. Yeah, wasn't the director's goal of it like a man rides a farting corpse and then um, uh, by the end of it you'll be crying or something like that? Yeah, like that I guess. Would... Yeah, it somehow makes you care. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a little backstory with Paul Dano. You actually understand him as a character, and you like him, and you care about what happens to him in this farting corpse movie. People don't like other people's farts. Is that why you don't fart in front of me? I just like to do it alone. <laughs> or hold it in. That's what you're supposed to do. That's so sad. I was amazed that this was a movie that actually held together and worked and, and kind of brought emotion out of like the way it was shot and the music and this uh, all that while still having like a, a farting corpse and using him as a as a like a fountain where he's got like water spewing out of yeah, the, out of yeah. his mouth <laughs> and just weird things like that I was like the, this should not the tone of this movie should not work but I'm enjoying it God, you know, well, don't, don't be afraid I saw another film, Jay. It's called, it's called The Adderall Diaries. What happens to us makes us who we are. Wave to daddy. It's in the past. It doesn't mean you need to bury it. Starring James Franco, who's secretly a genius poet, who occasionally does giant big budget schlock for cash, but also makes very artistic films like Palo Alto and The Adderall Diaries, based on a book by someone, someone. <laughs> based on a book by Zaba, 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 a book you never read or heard of. Uh, it sucked. <laughs> what is it? I mean, it I've never even heard of sucked. it. It <laughs> sucked. Uh, oh. He plays a guy who's an author, and he had a famous book about how his dad, Ed Harris, uh, beat him up as a kid, and how he overcame that and became like a great artist. But uh, I'd own. beat up James Franco if he was my kid, too. His only accomplishment was writing that book, 
and then his da he thinks his dad's dead, or really he knows his dad's not dead, but and then Ed Harris shows up at a book reading. He's like, you made it all up, you fucker. <laughs> and that turns out that uh, James Franco has his false memories, and his dad was really pretty, a pretty okay dad. Then the movie ends. This sounds riveting. It suck. If the movie ends, because Ed Harris, he's, he's a pretty old gentleman at this point. If the movie you're describing ended with him showing up at the book signing and being like, you made all that up, and then just beating the shit out of James Franco and throwing him around the bookstore. The book signing scene or the book reading uh, scene is pretty great when Ed Harris calls him out as being a fraud. <laughs> it's kind of satisfying because James Franco is an annoying character. I don't know. I guess James Franco uh, uh, allegedly is some kind of genius. <laughs> he, he goes to like Harvard and, and he's like, he has like a, a PhD in like molecular nuclear biology and is like a NASA astronaut and uh, <laughs> like, a, like a, a physicist. Uh, and, um, but he's also an artist and a poet and a painter and an engineer and a sculptor and a brain surgeon. <laughs> And the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> He's everything you could possibly want. And he was in Sausage Party. <laughs> <laughs> Get him straight, boys! Hey, look at this! We've got one! Oh, yes! We're chosen! Oh, yes! yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've been chosen together! <laughs> I have a weird hatred for Seth Rogen. I, I heard the the controversy about how they basically underpaid and forced the animators to work overtime. Oh. And then I was like, you know, the budget was like nine million dollars. Yeah. And then they, or, or it was like sixteen million dollars. And I'm like, let me guess, fifteen point nine went to the voice actors, and the rest went to poor animators who got yeah. underpaid to make this this POS. I was like, yeah, talking hot dogs. I get it. <laughs> Got it. They're penises. I don't, I, I, I'm not going to smoke a bowl and watch this uh, Seth Rogen. Yeah. Well, what I will say is I saw the trailer for it, which, uh, do you, uh, did you see the, the original trailer Wait, for it? You didn't watch Sausage Party thinking it was something else. <laughs> <laughs> it took you a while to get there. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it could The pipes, the pipes are coming. Oh Jesus, fuck! Oh, kill me skin! She's peeling me what? fucking skin! <laughs> fuck! Uh, oh, well, I saw the trailer for it, which was, it started like, like happy animated children's film, and then, you know, oh, we're, we're getting out of the grocery store, like a Toy Story thing, and then they get out, and then, uh, they start getting eaten at the house and it turns into like a horror film. And I was like, that's a really funny idea for a fake trailer. Mm. And I was like, that's it. That's all you need. Oh, it's a real movie. Uh, I guess there's probably an audience for this type of comedy, but it's not me. Um, I was, yeah, exactly. It's, it's the most obvious gags you could possibly think of. And like, not like, like the, uh, uh, the bagel is Jewish. Uh, there's a taco that's voiced by Salma Hayek, and she's also a lesbian. So it's just those like really, and not like like where it's bad in an offensive way, just more in like a juvenile that's incredibly obvious way. It has a weird sort of progressive message about like tolerance of other people's beliefs, which I thought was sort of interesting and I was surprised to see in the movie, but the humor is just so stupid that it's not worth it. A wonderful film that I believe we both saw. A wonderfully awkward film was called Hello, My Name is Doris. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. It's tight quarters. I like your glasses. I would like to introduce everyone to the new art director. Oh, hey, Doris. I just wanted another cup of coffee. Let me just get out of your way. Oh, ah, ow. I'm so sorry. You did that on purpose, didn't you? No. 
Anyway, <laughs> um, this was who, who directed this? Uh, um, it was Michael Showalter, which is Showalter, why I was curious because yeah. he who worked on What Had American Summer, and he directed a movie a few years ago called many years ago now called The Baxter that I liked. Um, so I was curious about it because of that. And it's solid. It's a solid little movie, just a little character movie about Sally Field as a as a hoarder. Your husband died fifteen years ago. Move on. You have packets of duck sauce in your refrigerator from the nineteen seventies. It keeps. Well, she's like she's like super eccentric and strange, like cat lady weird. And, yeah. Um, very withdrawn, and then she fantasizes about her boss, and it's like why can't they have fall in love and have a relationship? And then, and it's like, at first it, it, it's like, oh, this is just going to be a quirky thing. And then it's like, there's like this, this weird, like subtext or weird, like creepy, like she's really a weird person. Yeah. She's like quirky at first and it's sort of cute. And yeah. then she, it's, it's like, she, she's still sort of likable, but she gets a little, a little strange. Yeah. yeah. But then, but then they, they seal it up at the end and save it at yeah. the end, where it has an ambiguous ending where you don't know if it's uh, really happening or not. And yeah. it, it's kind of fun, um, but it's 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 a good movie. It's it's clever and funny, and you know, and Sally Field's really great in it. Mm -hmm. I'm awake, I'm awake, and I joined the LGBT knitting community. I'm not a lesbian, but I'm me there. You know, I feel that way in Staples. Uh, I watched the movie. That sucked. <laughs> called the family fang. Welcome. Oh, oh, God. What's with the bandages? You oh, did you see your brother's ah. ear? We wanted to play along. Caleb and Camille Fang are most known for creating improvised public events that incorporate their own children into the artwork. I was curious about this. It's like a family of performance artists, right? Uh, or the parents are performance artists? Yes. I was curious about it. I never saw it. In like the 70s, they're like, with their two kids, 70s, 80s, they're like, yeah, famous performance artists, which... People don't get famous for that. They're an ever famous performance artist. And they do like, they pretend to rob a bank and get shot. And then their children like lick their blood. Okay. And it's really stupid and weird. You're supposed to believe it as a real performance art thing. So it's dramatic. In, in the context of the movie. Okay. And they're like, we got it all on film. Like, and they're like, wh who filmed it in 1970? You know, they, like there weren't like security cameras in the bank. And, sure. and then they, they show like film footage, which is like the movie footage. And, and, and it's like, what? Like you, someone really could have gotten killed. Mm. You, you don't fake a bank robbery. Yeah. Like it was just bizarre. Okay. It, it's almost like where a foreigner made it, and then. Was this directed by Tommy Wiseau? Kind of. <laughs> That's where what it kind of felt like. Where it's like, what? Yeah. I don't understand this. <laughs> I hate this. Is it you don't understand like what kind of tone they were going for? Yes. Or? Okay. Mainly tone and logic. Uh, in defense of the movie, it's been a while since I've seen it, and it's one of those movies where my brain starts rejecting it. Mm. And I, I, it's like trying to remember, like, preschool, where I'm like, <laughs> I remember walking through a door. I probably held, held a crayon at some point. Like, that's, that's pretty much bits and pieces. I have to go under hypnosis to remember the movie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> It'll come out someday, like a repressed memory. Yeah, you know? a, a, a hypnotherapist has to put me under. It'll find out the plot to the family fang and that I was abducted oh, of course. by an alien. Yeah. They took me aboard a spaceship. No, no, we're, we're trying to remember the plot to the family <laughs> fang. They told me the date the world would end. No, 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 no. What happened in the family fang? Little hypnotherapy humor. The joke is, is that we're pushing aside the obviously important right. uh, repressed memories about my alien abduction. I understood the joke. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, I just wanted wanted to make sure you understood me. Things are really dead. I think no. it's very, very no, no, I don't. Possible. Well, I saw a film Fuck you. called Pee-wee's Big Holiday. Pee-wee! Hi, kids! <laughs> You're this. 
sweetest boy in Fairville. Morning, Pee Wee! Morning, Pee Wee! Haven't you ever wonder what life is like outside Fairville? Nope. You know I don't want to go anywhere or try anything new. Bye! Uh, the trailer for this looked terrible. There was no reason that this should work, but it's actually pretty good. I liked it quite a bit. Uh, it's also, like I mentioned, Greasy Strangler. It has a, a very strong John Waters vibe to it, which I was not expecting. Because um, Paul Rubens is, of course, in his 60s now, and there's a, a strong potential for him to be trotting out this character to just be, like, the most pathetic thing ever. But, well, I guess they digitally de-aged his face, so that kind of helps a little bit, because it doesn't look creepy. Like, uh, is that X-Men 3 when they de-age him, and it's really bizarre looking? Yeah. They look like wax sculptures. It's an early de-aging uh, Yeah, in, in, in this Pee-wee movie, you don't notice it at all. Um, but uh, Paul Rubin seems to know that he's a little too old for this shtick, so he kind of lets the scenarios take a big part in the comedy as opposed to just him like right in the forefront, like the old days of Pee-wee's Big Adventure. It gets weirder and weirder as it goes along, and I was not expecting it to get as bizarre as it does. There's a, a whole section of the movie that's a tribute to Russ Meyer films, like Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. You jackers, where are you headed? Drive, pip squeak. It's also the greatest love story of the year. Cool. Between uh, Pee Wee Herman and Joe, what's his name? From Ma Mangiano. Mangiano as himself. Who was famously in the Magic Mike films. Joe Mangiano plays a man in Magic Mike 2 whose penis is so big he cannot find a woman who can handle him until he meets Andy McDowell at a house party and she can take his gigantic cock. Well, that's a weird coincidence because there's a scene just like that in Pee-wee's Big Holiday. <laughs> oh, yeah. Except for it's Pee-wee. <laughs> Except for it's Pee-wee. It's, there's no reason that a Pee-wee Herbert movie made in 2016 should actually work, but it's pretty good. I, I, I might watch it now. I, I really have no interest in Pee-wee Herman anymore, but... I, I mean, I loved Pee Wee Herman when I was a little kid. Pee Wee's I, I Big Adventure is one I of the best too. comedies yeah. ever. Oh yeah, Pee Wee's Big um, Adventure is a, a, a masterpiece. Yeah, and this is no Pee Wee's Big Adventure by any means, but I think it helps that, uh, like, making it like a direct-to-Netflix movie, there's no real expectations for it, where you're just like, ah, I guess I'll watch this. So when it turns out to actually be pretty, like, imaginative and fun, it's like, oh, good. And I was not expecting the, the weird camp elements, like the... Russ Meyer references and John Waters stuff, so. Who directed it? Um, the guy who directed it was the creator of the TV show Wonder Chosen. I'll gobble a goat's balls for another sip. Oh, if you remember that show, which yes, is a pretty yes. fucking weird show. Okay. L-A-T-T, I-H-T-B-D. Look at the time, I have to be going. Well, we both saw one more film this year that we didn't talk about on Half in the Bag, and it was called Mr. Right, starring Anna Kendrick and Sam Rockwell, and it was written by Max Landis. So that was 2016. Yes. 